Thanks, everybody. Welcome. Uh, sometimes I feel like I give interruptions for a living. I guess in some ways it's kind of true. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to uh, introduce today's speaker, who is uh, our Rotman lecturer uh, for uh, this term. Uh, Dr. Daniel Hausen comes from us today from the University of Wisconsin Madison, where, as I mentioned last night, he's taught for three decades. Uh, his research addresses issues at the intersection of both economics uh, and philosophy, and it's currently focused on ethical, uh, the ethical appraisal of the use of cost-effectiveness information to allocate health-related resources. Uh, with Michael McPherson, he founded the excellent journal, he didn't put excellent there, but I did, economics uh, and philosophy, from which I've personally derived a lot of both joy and information. Uh, and his most recent book is also excellent, it's called Valuing Health, Well-Being, Freedom, and Suffering. And this summer, he will be joining a new center for population-level bioethics at Rutgers University. And of course, we're very happy to have him. So please join me in welcoming for his talk today, which is entitled Fair Healthcare. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction, and I'm really delighted to be here. I've had a lovely time, and it's also lovely uh, just speaking in such a, a wonderful uh, environment. Uh, so I'm going to ask two questions. What is a fair allocation of health care, and is using cost effectiveness to allocate health care unfair? I'm not going to answer the questions. Uh, I really don't know what the answers are. Uh, and uh, philosophers uh, often get away with asking questions and being unable to answer them. Uh, I think I've got some things to say that will help with, an ans with answering, although they also emphasize how difficult it is to answer these questions. So uh, if we've got, just for the purpose of argument, a fixed health budget and we want to maximize population health, which of course is not necessarily the only thing the health budget should be used for. But nevertheless, if we've got a fixed health budget and we want to maximize uh, population health, then we should use cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness is the idea that you look at the ratio, well, I'll be talking about it in a second, but I'm preempting my own slide. Uh, you look at the ratio between the cost in dollars and the effectiveness in some sort of measure of how good health interventions are, and you have to, of course, put everything on the same scale there. And if you minimize that, you're getting the most that you possibly can for, uh, out, of, out of your dollars, and you're maximizing population health. Uh, now, I'm going to be concerned with the fairness of allocating health that way, and I'm going to ignore immense problems. There's huge technical problems in terms of defining cost effectiveness. There's questions about the objective. Should we aim at maximizing population health? Uh, health systems do a lot of things besides improving health. One of the things that uh, differentiates Canada from the United States is if you get sick in Canada, you don't have to worry about going bankrupt. Well, in the United States, you do have to worry go about going bankrupt. And even if it doesn't make any difference to your health to have universal health care, it makes a huge difference to your financial security. So there's lots of things we should be thinking about other than maximizing health. I'm not going to worry about that. There's a question about where does the budget come from? And those are important moral questions. Not going to worry about those either. And just a technical thing, uh, people often describe what I'm calling cost effectiveness as cost value analysis or cost utility analysis. But that's just uh, terminological stuff. So here's an outline. First, I'm going to uh, sketch some of the objections to the use of cost effectiveness um, analysis to allocate healthcare. On the slides, I've written CE allocation, allocation via cost effectiveness. I'm then going to turn to philosophical theories of fairness, in particular theories of the fair distribution of divisible goods and then of indivisible goods. I'm then going to discuss some of the difficulties with those theories and ways that you might elaborate the theories and uh, at least attempt to deal with those difficulties. I'll then finally get back to healthcare and point out the diff how hard it is to apply the philosophical theories to the questions about uh, how we should be distributing healthcare. 
and then reach a conclusion. Uh, I may not get through everything. Uh, the handouts uh, are, are really not necessary. They're uh, uh, mementos, if you like, and perhaps will help in discussion. So as I was saying, what we're doing with cost-effective uh, cost allocation is we're looking at cost-effectiveness ratios, where cost is of a, some policy, some medical intervention is in dollars or euros or whatever your unit of uh, monetary unit is. And it's not always all that easy to determine how costly some policy would be, but it's relatively straightforward. Effectiveness is a whole lot more complicated. Uh, you can measure effectiveness. What we want to do is we want somehow or other to put various kinds of health interventions which improve people's health in one way or another. We want to put them all on the same scale, which is no easy thing to do. And the way it's done is that we categorize different um, uh, ways that people's health is good or bad uh, in terms of some uh, set of health states, and then via po basically population preference surveys, assign qualities, uh, quality measures to those health states. Uh, the jargon is health-related quality of, of life, but basically what one does is just looks, look at what people's uh, preferences are concerning, w well, I mean, just there's a variety of different ways. The easiest thing to do is you can imagine just a, a scale from the worst health to the best health. You can say, well, if you were blind, where would you put yourself on the this, on this scale? We assign zero as the quality of death, a quality of health when you're dead. Uh, and that's and of course there might be health states worse worse than death that have negative values and quality of health for full health, the quality of uh, full health that's not being an Olympic athlete or whatever, but it's basically having no significant uh, health uh, disadvantages uh, that would have a quality weighting of one, and then uh, that that's how we're somehow or they're going to get uh, uh, the numbers that will measure the effectiveness of health, and then we want to choose the alternative with the lowest cost-effectiveness ratio. So what's the matter with that? Well, there's one objection which seems really crushing and is uh, very, very serious, and it's objection in terms of discrimination against those with various kinds of disabilities. So, for example, suppose that you've got someone who's uh, uh, been in the American military and is suffering from, um, uh, I'm blocking the uh, word, <laughs> pardon me, PTSD. yeah, PTSD, uh, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. And so th their quality of life is not one, let's say it's at 0.75 or something like that. Well, suppose there's a, a flu out there and we've got limited vaccine and we can save people's lives. Well, if we save the life of someone who's in full health, we get a full, you know, a, a full unit, and let's say they're going to have 30 years of life ahead of them, so we get 30 qualities. We save the life of someone who has PTSD, and we are only getting 0.75 quality a year. We're getting, you know, instead of getting uh, 30 qualities, we're getting 22.5 qualities. And so clearly, from a cost-effectiveness uh, perspective, if our vaccine is limited, nobody with a disability gets any vaccine. They die off. We get a healthier population. Great, right? Well, no. I mean, obviously, at that point, that's not what you want to be doing. And of course, it's and even though cost-effectiveness is used here in Canada and very systematically in England, it's not used in a way that uh, that has those implications. But clearly, we've got to limit or constrain cost effectiveness somehow or other because we don't want that conclusion. Uh, the other objections are less obviously serious objections. And I've, in fact, uh, criticized in other work the severity objection and the non aggregation objection. I put those in parentheses because I'm going to comment on them very, very briefly. The severity objection is. Basically, if we can bring about the same increase in the quality of life of two individuals and one of them is in a more severe health state, 
intuitively, lots of people say, well, we should favor the person who's in the uh, more severe health state. Cost effectiveness says it's indifferent. If we're bringing about the same health benefit for the same uh, cost, it doesn't matter whether somebody's in a really bad health state or in a moderate health state. Uh, uh, I don't think that objection is actually a, a very good one, but uh, that's I'm definitely outnumbered by lots of people who think that's a, quite a serious objection. Non-aggregation, uh, if we've got, a, uh, well, the, the most uh, notorious example of this was in the Oregon, uh, there was an Oregon experiment of changing the way they uh, did their Medicaid, and they listed various kinds of, uh, of interventions, and they decided that it was more effective to uh, treat, uh, to cap uh, teeth than to provide people with um, uh, uh, boy, I'm really having trouble with word blocking, uh, with uh, uh, operations for their uh, uh, with a, a appendicitis operations. Uh, and the idea is that tooth capping is cheap, and if you do a, a lot of them, you get more bang for your buck than saving someone's life uh, who has a, an a, a appendicitis. And that obviously strikes people as outrageous. Uh, there's a lot to be said about it. I don't think the objection is as, as strong as it appears to be. The fair chances objection is that well, to take a very simple example, uh, suppose that we had two candidates uh, for a heart transplant. They're both going to die in a week without the transplant. We've got one heart that we can transplant. One of these candidates is likely to live 20 healthy years with the heart. The other is likely to live 22 years with the heart. Cost effectiveness says you give it to the one with 22, who's likely to have 22 years. Intuitively, you say, hold on a second. The one who could have 20 years of life, that's an enormous benefit. And why should this small difference mean that one person gets the heart and the other has no chance whatsoever of getting the heart? Shouldn't we have some kind of a lottery here, perhaps a weighted lottery where it's some favor, uh, where we're favoring the person who would get a longer life? But in any case, the notion that we just give it to the one for whom we uh, expect to get the largest benefit. And of course, obviously, there's a lot of uncertainties. The next day, the person might get run over by a truck, of course. Uh, but nevertheless, that strikes people as outrageously unfair. So I mean, one, one wants to ask, well, are these objections really objections to fairness? And of course, then the problem is, well, what do we mean by fairness? Intuitively, I think one of the things that we think of as crucial to fairness is impartiality. And we think of what's fair is if we're distributing benefits and burdens, we should be distributing them equally, except where there are differences in things like rights, responsibility, desert, needs, etc. cetera, uh, but that the default is a, is a kind of uh, equality. Um, and then the question is, well, what exactly, how do we characterize the unfairness of a cost-effective allocation? Exactly, exactly what makes it unfair? And so we should then turn to philosophical theories of fairness and to section two. So I'm going to start with a, a theory of fairness that's due to John Broom. He's certainly not the first person who wrote on fairness, but I, it's a very, very influential essay, and it really attempts to distinguish a subject matter for fair distribution that's distinct from other kinds of ethical considerations that we might have. And in Broom's theory, a fair distribution should satisfy people's claims, and I'll say what a claim is in a moment, in proportion to, uh, to their strength. So Broom has the idea that people have claims, and these claims are of different strength, and we should satisfy the, these, those claims to the extent that we can uh, proportionally to the strength of those claims. Now, what's a claim? A claim, I mean, Broom doesn't actually say very much about a claim, but a, a claim uh, exists when someone has a, when there's a pro tanto duty owed to someone that the uh, individual re receive it. So the simplest case would be if in the case of promising, for example. Uh, if I make a, a promise to Anthony, uh, 
to provide him with a, a certain object or whatever. He then has a claim on me that he pres that he uh, uh, obtain or that object from me. So claims are, uh, you know, related to duties to to individuals. Claims arise from things like promises. They may arise from uh, considerations of desert. They might arrive, arise from considerations of need. Uh, just the notion that someone might benefit from something is not enough to uh, uh, generate a, uh, a, uh, a claim. And in talking about the satisfaction of a claim, Broom isn't talking about feelings of satisfaction. He's just talking about providing what, uh, what the claim is a claim to. In his view, uh, fair, the fairness of satisfaction of claims is entirely a comparative matter. So if we've got uh, individuals with a variety of claims and we give them all nothing, that's perfectly fair. It's not desirable. There's, he's, it's not like fairness is the only consideration. Uh, it's going to be very rare that it'd be better not to, not to give anyone anything rather than to attempt to satisfy their claims to some extent. But in Broom's view, it's, uh, uh, it's perfectly fair. So in terms of the distributive view, there's an anecdote that's worth uh, recalling here. Uh, my dissertation advisor was uh, Sidney Morgan Besser, who was a very, very uh, witty man. And he was called for jury duty in New York. And he was a police brutality case. And he was asked whether he'd ever been treated unfairly by the police. He said, well, up at Columbia, uh, during the student riots, they hit me over the head, but it was perfectly fair. They hit everyone over the head. <laughs> and that sort of fits with Broom's view of fairness. So provided that you're treating people equally, uh, you're satisfying their claims, or in this case, failing to satisfy certain claims equally, you're behaving fairly. Now, if we want to apply this to healthcare, we need to figure out what kinds of claims people have to healthcare. And one might start out as, as an oversimplification to think of those claims as depending exclusively on needs and on whatever the institutional rules were concerning uh, how needs should be treated. So let's turn then to fair distribution of indivisible goods. Uh, intuitively, and this is, I think everybody has this kind of intuition, if we've got two individuals who are claiming the, the same good, their claims are equally strong, then intuitively we should just have a lottery, flip a coin or whatever, and that seems like the right thing to do. Now why are lotteries an attractive solution, or lotteries or coin flips or some randomizing dev random device, why are those an intuitively attractive way of dealing with, uh, with claims? Well. Intuitively, we think of fairness as having a lot to do with impartiality, and these lotteries are obviously impartial. And by giving individuals who have equal claims uh, equal chances, we're not discriminating among individuals. We're showing equal respect to the individuals, and that seems to be that seems to be a good reason why we might uh, have lotteries. Now. If we have individuals who have unequal claims, one individual has a stronger claim than another, then Broom favors weighted lotteries, but this is quite controversial in the literature, and there's a number of philosophers uh, who, uh, Brad Hooker for one, more recently Hugh Lazenby, who maintain that that's, that's really a mistake, that if we got individuals who have stronger claims, they should get the good, and we shouldn't hold lotteries. Now, if what we're concerned about is impartiality, it would, if that's what we're, the crucial thing in fairness, then it's really puzzling why cost-effective allocation is problematic, because it is certainly uh, uh, impartial. It treats people's claims uh, uh, equally. However, it relates claims to things that one might uh, I hesitate to think that uh, claims should depend upon. In the case that I gave it discrimination, the cost of cost effectiveness is taking the claim as depending upon how great a benefit someone uh, uh, can achieve, and perhaps that's the wrong way to think about what generates claims. 
Broome doesn't say much about what generates claims, and we'll be seeing the difficulty with that in a little bit. Now, Broome thinks that there's more to the attractiveness of lotteries than simply impartiality or expressing respect. And I have a quotation here from Broome, which runs over to the next slide. Um, in that case, this is Broome speaking. In that case, he's speaking of indivisible goods. The candidates' claims cannot all be equally satisfied because some candidates will get the good and others will not. So some unfairness is inevitable. But a sort of partial equality in satisfaction, again, this isn't feeling of satisfaction, this isn't getting what you have cla claimed to, uh, but a sort of partial equality in satisfaction can be achieved. Each person can be given a sort of surrogate satisfaction. By holding a lottery, each can be given an equal chance of getting the good. This is not perfect fairness, but it meets the requirements of fairness to some extent. It does so, of course, only if giving a person a chance of getting the good counts as a surrogate satisfaction of her claim. This seems plausible to me. After all, if you have a chance of getting the good, you may actually get it. It is quite different from merely giving the claim its proper weight against other reasons. That does not satisfy it in any way. So in Broom's view, a fair distribution of chances mirrors what the distribution of the good would have been uh, if the good had been divisible, and that that provides a surrogate satisfaction of claims, whatever in the world that is. And the question is, well, what is it exactly that makes this fair? What is Broom going on about here? And it's really puzzling, and the, a number of people in the literature have commented on it. So what in the world is the surrogate satisfaction of claims? Um, now, for Broom, the surrogate satisfaction of claims is precisely why he prefers weighted lotteries when claims are unequal. And there's some construals of surrogate satisfaction, which I won't discuss. I'm skipping over what Lazenby and what Vong have to say. We can come back to that discussion if, if people are interested in it. Uh, crucial to Broom's notion of surrogate satisfaction is that it acknowledges claims by linking their strength to the probability that they'll be satisfied. Well, let's think harder about lotteries and how they might provide surrogate satisfaction. So what's good about lotteries? As I mentioned before, their impartiality. We like that. They're, they're safe from cheating. I mean, obviously one can cheat in lotteries, but it's pretty hard. They're transparent. Other methods of distributing goods, the chances of there being bias, of there being corruption, seem much larger than when we're relying on a coin flip or another random device. They're cheap. That's handy. They express uh, respect. And they also distrib distribute prospects that have value. If you have a lottery, depending upon the size of the prize and the number of tickets, the tickets are really worth something to, be, uh, to uh, individuals. Individuals can buy and sell lottery tickets. And so if we're distributing equal numbers of lotteries, we're just lottery tickets to individual, we're distributing them pro prospects of equal value. And that is in accord with the notion of fairness, of treating people equally. And so those seem to be uh, considerable virtues of lotteries. Now note that these virtues require only epistemic probabilities. The impartiality, if you've got the allocator, and let's think of this in the context of just two claimants with equal claims. If you have just the allocator and the two claimants, provided that they believe that the, they have a randomized device, a, ran, a random device with probability one half, then uh, it's going to appear to everyone to be impartial. Now, you might say, well, it's not really impartial if it only appears to them, but really the only thing that seems to be relevant to the impartiality is people's beliefs about what the probabilities are. Certainly, the, the issues of whether it's, it's free from corruption and cheap, that's, we certainly don't need anything beyond epistemic probabilities for the expression of, of respect, and also for the uh, market value, for the exchange value of lottery tickets. Once again, we only need epistemic probabilities. 
But think about the following case. I, I call this the case of Brian, Betty, and the uh, bias coin. Suppose that we have a random, our random device is going to be a coin which has Brian and Betty are the two individuals who have equal claims to a single good. We're going to try to uh, treat them fairly. And we've got a coin which we have a super duper machine that produces this coin which has Brian's name on one side, Betty's name on the other side. The machine malfunctions. Nobody knows this, but it's got Brian's name on both on both sides. We flip it. It, unsurprisingly to us, not to the individuals in, involved, uh, lands with Brian's name up. Uh, in terms of impartiality, expressing res respect, distributing prospects with value, all of that we've we've satisfied. But intuitively, we haven't treated Betty fairly at all. Uh, she she never had a, she never had a chance, and so what Broom maintains is that surrogate satisfaction requires providing objective chances of getting the good that are proportional to the strength of claims. He doesn't specifically say this, but I think this is uh, implicit in what he's concerned with. Now you might say, hold on a second. Uh, to a first approximation, at least, coins are deterministic systems. Maybe we've got some indeterminism, but suppose the universe, at least with respect to the devices that we actually use to determine claims, that we're really looking at deterministic devices here. How in the world do we get objective chances? Well, I actually don't think there's any problem about getting uh, objective chances these are chances, intermediate chances, not chances of zero or one, of getting objective chances in a deterministic uh, universe. And I think that the way to look at this is in terms of what kind of conditional probabilities you're, uh, you're concerned with. So the probability that a coin will land heads in a deterministic universe, conditional on a perfectly specific characterization of all the relevant uh, circumstances, or if you like to say, conditional on the specific point in phase space that this coin and everything else is uh, is in, that's going to be one or zero. But there's another conditional probability. That's the conditional probability that a, land, a coin will land heads. That's conditional on basically the a uh, uh, an area in the phase space on a range of values of relevant variables that's consistent with the best possible measurement of all relevant circumstances. And for each of those points within that region, there's going to be a one or zero, but over the region as, as a whole, there's going to be a frequency of one and zero, ones and zeros that is uh, probably not perfectly equal, but uh, close enough to, uh, to 0.5 that we can see the coin flip as being fair. So all that's actually pretty straightforward. There are those objective probabilities. The question is, which of these is actually relevant? And it's a longer argument than I'm going to make right now, but I, I think that the latter is the relevant one because it enables us to make the common sense distinction. There's a real difference between flipping an ordinary coin and flipping the coin with, that has Brian's name on both sides. And we've, we've got to have a way of, of capturing that, and it's not, and it's a non-epistemic difference. So let me then talk about some of the problems that arise with respect to these accounts of fairness. Well, Broom's supposing that we've got a single, in the case of indivisible goods, we've got a, a, a single good that we're distributing, and individuals have claims of differing strengths to it. In the case of divisible goods, we've got people who have, we've got a number of goods and individuals have claims of differing strengths to the, to the good. But what Broom doesn't discuss is the notion that people have claims of different sizes, as it were. So if a firm goes bankrupt, for example, there's a number of creditors who are owed certain amounts of money by, uh, by the firm. The creditors' claims are, let us suppose, equally strong, but they're not equal in size. One creditor may uh, 
uh, be owed $10,000, another creditor $15,000. So how do we deal with claims that differ in quantity? Well, in a paper criticizing Broom in 2014, uh, Benjamin Curtis lays, lays out a way of doing it. I'm going to des describe the way it's uh, reformulated by uh, Wintine and Heilman in a 2018 paper. So they, they say, well, what, what we should do is we should think of this in terms of what they call a claims problem. And a claims problem consists of, first of all, a divisible or indivisible amount of a good, E, which is greater than zero, which they call the uh, estate. That's the, third, the jargon they're using. Secondly, there's a set of agents, N, and there's a claims vector specifying the amount that each of the agents claims. And we're going to suppose that the total amount claimed is greater than or equal to the uh, estate. If it's less than uh, the, the estate, there isn't a problem. You just satisfy all the claims fully. So for example, suppose that the estate is 20. We've got three individuals, one, two, and three. Individual one claims eight units. Individual two claims 10 units. Individual three claims seven units. So the total amount that's claimed is 25, assuming I can add 8, 10, and 7 correctly. And so the extent to which the estate satisfies the aggregate claims, the, the state is four-fifths of the aggregate claims. 0.8 is what I've called alpha here. This is actually my terminology. The ratio between the estate and the total amount claimed. And so the claim is that what fairness requires is that each individual receives the same proportionate claims. So if the good is divisible, the first individual gets 6.4 units, the second individual gets 8 units, and the third individual gets 5.6 units, we have satisfy all the claims proportionately. And that seems like a reasonable way to go. Now, if it's the case that the good is indivisible, it, intuitively, it seems like what we should do is we should give individual one six units, individual two eight units, individual three five units, and then perhaps have a weighted lottery between individual one and individual three, with individual three having a higher weight on it. And so as a result, uh, it could turn out that individual one gets seven units. It could turn out that individual three gets six units. But that's how, that's how we'll do, deal with this. Alternatively, there are various kinds of rounding rules you might use. You might say, well, we should round up uh, individuals three amount, and we round down individuals one amount. Uh, there's a variety of things you can do in the case of indivisible goods. This isn't the occasion for me to go through the various uh, possibilities. But one can see how. Uh, uh, claims problems would be addressed. Now, the problem is that in this supposed revision and uh, improvement of Broom's theory, the strength of claims has just dropped out. There's nothing here about strength of claims. So what do we do about that? So claims differ in quantity as well as in their strength. Well, what Wintine and Heilman suggest is they is say, well, let's look at what they call the strength, a strength weighted claim. That is the product of C sub i, that is the amount that individual i uh, is claiming, and S sub i, the strength of the individual's claim. So we can we can then define what, and I'm following, I'm quoting here, uh, Wintime and Heilman, uh, what they call a corrected claims problem, where we have an estate. As before, we've got a number of individuals, and then we've got a vector specifying the strength collected claim, corrected claim of each individual. But, and here a graduate student helped me see this, this isn't going to work at all. So, example, suppose we've got two individuals, A and B, and their strength weighted claims are identical. Their strength weighted claims are three. The estate is four. How should we divide it? Well, the answer, you, the, what one needs to realize is there's no way to answer that at all. 
So suppose, for example, that A's claim was for one unit and its strength was three. B's claim was for three units and its strength was one. So the, the strength weighted claims are identical, three for both of them. Now, in this particular case, clearly what we want to do is we want to give three units to B and one unit to A. We fully satisfy their claims. However, suppose that instead both of them had claims to three and had the same uh, strength of claims, strength of claims one, then once again we'd have the same strength weighted claims, but now of course we'd want, actually want to split the estate evenly, each of them getting two. Merely knowing the strength weighted claims doesn't give you a well-defined problem and it can't be answered. So clearly we have to go back to the drawing board and do something different to deal with both strength and quantity in a theory of fairness, and I don't know how to do that. I've been trying various things, but uh, I don't know how to do that. This is an open problem. So let's then turn to uh, looking at how this bears on healthcare. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of problems if you try to bring these theories of fairness to bear on healthcare. So first of all, there's the problem I mentioned before in which I uh, at least temporarily just stipulated a response to, that is what claims to healthcare of what strength do people have? Uh, I really have no idea how to answer that question. I mean, clearly people have, we can talk about people's needs for healthcare, but how that translates into their claims for healthcare and, uh, whether the way it translates into claims in a, one particular healthcare system or another, whether that's uh, morally acceptable, there's, a, there's huge problems there which have to be addressed. Secondly, we've got the problems that we just looked at. Healthcare claims differ both in quantity and in strength. You can imagine you've got two individuals who need uh, uh, doses of doxycycline. One of them needs it to save their life, but just a few doses. The other one has Lyme's, Lyme disease and needs a very long course. Well, the one who has Lyme disease and needs a long course needs lots and lots of dox, doxycycline. The one who is going to die without it may need only very few units, but obviously needs it a whole lot more. And if you allow need to translate into claims, we think of the individual who would die, but uh, for the doxycycline is having a much stronger claim. So we've got this problem of how do we deal with both quantity and strength in a single theory. Third, the theory on the account of, if you look at the work on fairness, it assumes that, <coughs> it assumes that the goods are just sort of there. They're sitting on the shelf and then we're distributing it. But of course, goods aren't like that, except for mana that falls from heaven or whatever, or you know maybe uh, blackberries in a field that haven't been cultivated. I mean, the goods aren't just there. They have to be produced, and they have costs. Uh, and exactly how are we supposed to take into account costs and questions about what goods to be provided within a theory of fairness? If you think about it, when we're th it's sort of misleading to look at a particular healthcare intervention and to, to take its cost as something that's contributing to the fair fairness or as something that's irrelevant to the fairness. It, the most general way to be looking at it is we've got all these resources and we have all these different things that can be done with these resources and that uh, if this resource is expensive, and we provide it to people, what we're doing is we're refusing to satisfy some other people's claims. So the, the costs are indications of claims of other people that will or won't get satisfied if we, if we provide this particular treatment to this individual. So I mean, if we take a, a simple example, so we've got Glenn and Glenda, they've got exactly the, the same symptoms, and they've got the same prognosis, provided they re receive proper treatment. 
but proper treatment differs. Glenn needs a much more expensive medication. Suppose they both uh, have an infection, needs to be treated with antibiotics. One of them is resistant to cheap antibiotics, and you have to use something very expensive. Glenda isn't resistant to cheap antibiotics. She's cheap to treat. Now, it seems like if they're in the same health situation, in terms of their symptoms and their prognosis, it would seem as if their claims should be equal. On the other hand, if we uh, uh, provide treatment to both Glenn and Glenda, we're not going to be we're not going to have resources to resources to uh, satisfy what may be very pressing claims of lots of other individuals. And of course, healthcare systems are very severely uh, resource constrained, especially in poorer countries. And as a result. It's very often the case that individuals whose health states are very, very similar, one of them will get treated and one of them won't get treated. And exactly, exactly how does fairness enter here? And that leads us to the fourth problem, and the fourth problem is, is the hairiest one. What we really should be asking is the question that I have here. What constitutes fair treatment of claims where the claims are of different strengths, their claims to different quantities, of different treatments, at different costs, where those treatments may be substitutes, that is, one, it may be there's a variety of treatments that all would work and you could use one instead of the other, or they may be complements that if you use one treatment, then other treatments uh, 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 may be re required or uh, preferable given the particular treatment that you started with. That's what we're dealing with when we're thinking about uh, how to treat claims to uh, healthcare, assuming we understood what the claims to healthcare were uh, fairly. And if you think about it, this is a much, much more complicated question than the questions that the theories of fairness I described before uh, answer. So what in the world should you do? How in the world should you attempt to answer these questions, uh, this qu difficult question? Well, I don't know. I'm just going to sketch some possibilities which don't work. So you might say, well, let's just disaggregate. Let's look at particular treatments and claims to those, those treatments and just think about how we should do those th things fairly. But of course, the treatments all pool, all um, draw from the same pool of resources. And so we can't separate things like that and decide what would be the fair way of dealing with this treatment as opposed to, and then here's another condition, we have another treatment, because what we decide to do in terms of satisfying claims here is going to limit the resources that are available to satisfying claims over there. So we can't disaggregate. Uh, we have to, we have to, uh, we have to treat this as a general problem of how do we satisfy uh, claims that, sa that differ in all these different dimensions that are described on top. Um, second, you might try to take the, these as claims not to particular treatments, but as claims on certain portions of the healthcare budget. But very little reflection shows that that's a non-starter because there's no proportionality between the significance of different treatments and how much they cost. There are treatments that are life-saving that are very cheap, and there's treatments that are very expensive that don't do much good uh, uh, at all. Uh, a third is to try to borrow a trick from the economist playbook. Uh, economists addressing questions of uh, egalitarianism, this actually goes back to uh, philosophers uh, as well, the question is, well, what's an uh, equal allocation of consumption goods in a population. We might say everybody gets exactly the same consumption goods, but that would be ridiculously uh, inefficient. You know, we would have loads of swimsuits, which would be just great in weather like this, and, you know, in Polynesia, people would have great, uh, great down coats. And so we, we clearly don't want everyone to have the same allocation of consumption goods, uh, which I mean, that would be a kind of equality, but it'd be a kind of ridiculous equality. And if we don't have that, what, what would 
an equal distribution B. And what economists have proposed is, well, if you have a distribution that's such that nobody prefers the bundle of commodities that anyone else has to their own bundle of commodities, then that's equal. And they talk about this in terms of it being envy-free. That is, uh, this isn't a serious theory of envy, but rather envy is simply a word that's being used for preferring somebody else's bundle of commodities to your own. Now, that might seem like a tempting way to go with respect to the issue of what would be a fair or egalitarian distribution of, uh, of health care. But if you think about it, it's really not going to work because so many things are going to influence people's preferences among treatments, among different health states that have nothing to do with the distribution of uh, uh, health care to, uh, to individuals. So uh, if I've just had uh, a bout of chemotherapy, which was unsuccessful, and they've sort of run out of uh, tricks to play, and I'm dying of uh, uh, one cancer or another, not a particularly happy uh, scenario to envision, uh, I think I might have strong preferences for the health states of other individuals, strong preferences for the kinds of uh, treatments they, that they've uh, successfully had. And that would have no nothing to do with the uh, fairness or unfairness of the healthcare system. So let me come to my conclusions. Um, I haven't really argued that philosophical theories of fairness are mistaken. What I've argued is that the, the theories of fairness that one can find in the literature are in need of a lot of further development. They don't yet provide much guidance, at least concerning the fair allocation of health care. Secondly, that it's I think it's questionable whether the, I haven't argue, ar argued this, I shouldn't actually put it in conclusions, but it's what I believe, it's questionable whether all the ethical critiques of cost-effective allocation are justified and whether the problems they're concerned with are all problems of fairness as opposed to other ethical uh, drawbacks. And finally, just a platitude, but it's one that's worth reminding us all of, fairness is obviously not the only moral consideration that bears on healthcare policies, and it's not always the most important one. Uh, and sometimes we, um, uh, might have to just accept pretty unfair outcomes because we get a lot of good out of them. So that's my story. So do I, I just take question? Okay. Yeah, Bill. Another fact, I mean, the factor that seems to operate is you get a hospital that's really good at dealing with certain things. Right. And then they want to get really better in that to be the center for whatever. Right. And that, uh, that provides. Is that, are they going against fairness when they're trying to do that? Or? Or how do you combine that with appropriate well, ways of looking at it? It would really depend on access to that hospital. I mean, if uh, it's a specialty hospital that serves the entire Canadian population, uh, in principle, although it might be more difficult for some people to access it or other, and it's becoming a uh, center of excellence for the treatment of X, uh, I don't see anything unfair about that. On the other hand, if it's drawing resources to just uh, one community and is, for one way or another, sort of blocking others from getting those resources, then, I mean, we're le you know, my answer is just at the level of intuitions about fairness, which I think are incredibly vague, because I don't know the theories help, help very much, but th that would appear to me to be quite unfair. and. You know, and I might be able to make a case in terms of those theories, but the theories aren't guiding my response to that. Right, but I'm thinking about the, uh, I mean, isn't there, 
putting the focus, oh, look, we can really do this. It's going to be really, really expensive. We're going to need lots of MRI machines or whatever. Sure. Uh, and uh, that is taking costs from other places. Right. Well, I, I, was assuming, I was assuming that it was cost effective what they were doing. I mean, if what they're doing isn't cost effective, uh, uh, I, I'm taking cost effectiveness as a kind of um, uh, default, which we clearly can't follow all the way because of the discrimination problem I described. But that, uh, uh, you know, if, if they're drawing resources in a way which is beneficial, but, which is be but at a cost which prevents uh, the healthcare system from providing a great deal more benefits somewhere else, then it's then just on utilitarian grounds, you know, this is uh, something that's uh, uh, offensive and unacceptable. But how would you determine? Well, if you're willing to accept the measures of effectiveness that exist there, which depend upon these health measurement systems, which have lots and lots of problems in it, then you can say, OK, well, this is, um, let's, uh, let's suppose it's life-saving for a very small population at such and such a cost. So we have, you know, we've got so many individuals, so many years of life saved, we can, you know, uh, fairly easily specify the qualities here. We've got the cost, so we've got the cost per quality, and it's going to be huge. It's, you know, millions of dollars per quality. I mean, that would be outrageous. And then we can look and see what else we could do with those million dollars, how many qualities we could get someplace else, and it's going to be way, 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 way more. So the cost per quality elsewhere is going to be much lower, and, you know, we'll, we will be, uh, be behaving in a cost ineffective way and not providing the quantity of benefits we otherwise could provide. Now where does fairness come in? I don't, clearly we have very strong intuitions that uh, it, this would also be unfair. And it seems like it's unfair because it's so cost ineffective. So it seems like fairness and cost and effective are walking hand by hand. They're you know, linked arms. They're you know, a great couple. But then we turn to other places and we go, uh-oh, divorce is coming. We've got you know, unpleasantness in this couple. And cost effectiveness and fairness are coming apart. I'm thinking that the, 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 if you really what I'm worried about is overdoing the fairness can interfere with developing real breakthroughs that would then lead to cures for things that we can't yet cure. Um, you have well, if we had a theory of fairness, maybe that would be one of the implications. But I don't think we've got a really good grasp on fairness here. And uh, if we suppose that allowing you know, more funds into research is going to give us things that will uh, help a few billionaires to live another couple of years, that's going to be objectionable from the perspective of, of fairness. If, on the other hand, there's a prospect that this would be beneficial to lots of individuals, we're then trading off future benefits, which we may want to discount or not discount, uh, and which are uncertain, against current benefits, which are uh, certain, but uh, which we may estimate to be much less. And so we're, we're going to have that kind of reasoning. And it's going to be simultaneously a question from a cost-effectiveness perspective with tremendous uncertainties built into it. And it's going to be a question about fairness. And it's exactly how far those two go together is really problematical. Because they really it's not like they're opposed to one another everywhere. They seem to actually run together pretty well on some of these questions and maybe this one. You, you had your hand up back there? 
Sorry, could you speak a little louder? And, uh, and I think you talked about the half drive stuff. And yes. Yes. Right. Or the cost effectiveness says that. I'm not saying that that's oh, no, our sorry. intuitions. I think our intuitions are to say, look, they should both have some chance at this heart. Okay. I think that's much more intuitive. Okay. Um, and so that, that's what led to uh, the the way to portray the idea. Right. And I just wanted you to say a bit more about the unfairness. Um, a, a, a couple of things. I mean, one thing, although it's a very handy uh, way of illustrating the, the issue, uh, cost effectiveness isn't so much going to be used uh, with respect to clinical judgments of who gets a heart. We're thinking much more in terms of policy. This is just an illustration. Uh, now, I have a little trouble answering your question because I'm not fully sympathetic to the considerations that other people feel very strongly here. But the, the intuition is, look, you've got two individuals. They've got their own lives to lead. And they both could benefit very, very substantially. But one can benefit a little bit more than the other. And now, is that little bit more benefit uh, actually a sufficient reason to cut the uh, other individual out from having any chance whatsoever of, of the benefit? And the intuition that a lot of people in this literature uh, have, uh, I can give you uh, references, is that fairness really demands that uh, those whose treatment is somewhat cost ineffective should nevertheless have some chance of getting a treatment. So if we think about this in an aggregate case, we've got two groups of individuals you know, thousands of individuals in these two groups. One of them is a little bit more, the individuals in one group are a little bit more cost effective to treat than the individuals in the other group. And so we say to this other group, forget it. You don't get any treatment. We give it all to this. And the notion is, well, shouldn't we distribute it a little bit? Shouldn't the people in the, in the group that is less cost effective but not completely cost ineffective to treat, shouldn't they really uh, have some share of this of this good. So uh, I think that's the intuition behind this cost, uh, this fair chances objection. Uh, it runs into a discrimination objection quite easily. Because if these, if these two groups are identifiable in other ways, and we're favoring one group over another group, then we can, you can say, well, look, we're stigmatizing one group. We're engaging in discriminatory behavior. I don't think that's built into the fair chances objection, but it's fair chances objection can slide into a discrimination objection. OK? Other? Yeah, uh, Max. So I'd like to pick up on the, uh, the problem of what claims the health care people have. Yes. Maybe not the strength part so much, but um, I'm just curious your thoughts on uh, what extent you think the framework of, of human rights helps to clarify or establish uh, people's claims to health care? It may not be much on the strength side, but perhaps more ground the claim itself. Um, I, 
I guess my problem is that it, it seems to me to just translate the, the issue rather than to solve it. So let's suppose that people have a right to health care. Uh, I actually have certain qualms about using that language because uh, exactly because it's so hard to uh, specify just what that right actually uh, entails. But then once we specify that they have a right to health care, the question is, what health care? And it seems to me that that's very much the same question as what claims uh, do uh, individuals have to health care? So uh, I wish I could say something uh, positive and helpful on it, but uh, I really am qu qu quite puzzled. Um, if you have a universal health care system and the uh, system specifies what kinds of things people will be treated for and not treated for, then you've got a legal framework that specifies what claims to health care people, people have. But the question then is, if we're defining a system, uh, and, and of course defining the system might be based on all sorts of things other than fairness in terms of what kinds of things we can afford and the like, but if you're defining a system, and if you're using as one of the considerations that you're using to specify the system, some pre-existing theory about what kinds of claims the healthcare people have, then I, I don't know how to respond to that. Uh, sorry, did, did yeah, you, I, so one of the, the current actual realities of the Canadian healthcare system is that because of the number of claims is outstripping our ability to meet those claims, yes. uh, patients end up being queued. And so you may be approved for a procedure, but you may be waiting for a year or two years uh -huh. to ultimately receive yes. that procedure. How, do, how does this concept of fairness factor into that? And so someone who's waiting, it, the current system, the way it works is that it's a first come, first serve type setup you're paid, placed on that list, not based on need, not based on quality, just based on the fact that you were approved to have the procedure performed. Um, so someone who may be in greater need will be waiting for as many days as the person in front of them in line, plus one, to ultimately receive that right. procedure. Does that have implications in terms of fairness? Yeah, I would think so. Uh, again, I'm going to be responding much more on the basis of an intuitive notion of fairness than on the basis of these theories. But uh, other things being equal, there's something quite appealing about first come, first serve. It actually has, uh, it treats people uh, 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 equally. Uh, it doesn't, it is pretty transparent. It's hard to jump, it's hard to jump the queue. On the other hand, people's needs really do differ. And if you've got someone in line for hip replacement who's, really in agony. They can't get out of bed and someone else, you know, they they can't do their jogging anymore, but they can live their everyday life reasonably comfortably. The notion that the latter person gets the hip replacement before the person who's badly disabled on it, that appears to be uh, quite unfair and also inefficient in right. terms of just a, a utilitarian perspective. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of is whether there are ways of sort of moving up in the queue if your condition is really uh, uh, grave. Uh, there are also fairness issues in the notion that some things have much longer queues than other things. And why should people suffering in one way be treated more promptly than people suffering in, uh, in another way? And then there's also fairness questions about whether, uh, well, Fair discussions about how many resources go into the health system altogether, which I didn't address at all, but then uh, also questions about whether more resources should be put into uh, shortening queues with the result that you're refusing to treat certain other things. And one would have to look at the, those precise trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Eric. Um, I have a hard time to follow on. You were using the, the two Brian points there. Yes. Uh, so what I thought you were going to do is to talk about, uh, so you wanted us to use that to, as a way of explaining maybe how we could be uh, 
Do I need to serve the bias? Or that I want to use that to argue that we need more than equal epistemic probabilities yeah. in order to treat people uh, fairly in terms of a, a, of a lottery. Because the way I set it up, I, or at least intended to set it up, no one knows that there's Brian on both sides of this coin. Yeah. Uh, that you know, the machine flips it, it lands Brian, and they think it was, it, they think that the other side says Betty, uh, and so. With respect to epistemic probabilities, the probability was, was one half. The lottery is unobjectionable. And I want to argue that with, I'm really following Broom here, although he doesn't get it going into these details, but at least in my interpretation of what he means by a surrogate satisfaction of the claim, and probably not the best language to have used, is that uh, it has to be the case that we're really giving individuals chances of getting. Uh, yeah. Yes. So I'm still trying to get a handle on what constitutes a claim. Um, yes. Seems, speak up too. Sorry, I'm trying to get a handle still on what constitutes a claim, which seems, I mean, really important in introducing fairness into a cost effectiveness uh -huh. evaluation. Um, so it seems like there are just two dimensions, strength and quantity. Um, yes and figuring out what these dimensions actually are is really important in determining what a claim is. Right. Um, so what I've been thinking about is that uh, I, I wonder if, so we're talking about a fair um, distribution of health resources, a fair allocation of health, um, but there's also unfairness in the distribution of health across the population. Sure. Um, so there's like lucky and unlucky people with health. Um, I wonder if a, I'm not sure whether okay. I want to follow you in saying that it's okay. fair or unfair. Right, so you're I, I, I'm a, a little uneasy of describing nature's actions as being fair or unfair. Okay. Um, well, then you might disagree with my suggestion. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So I, <laughs> so I wonder if there's a third dimension of claims, which is kind of your previous claims. So the idea being if you're really sick all the time and you have so a lot of discrete health events if taking account of kind of previous claims can in some way account for an unlucky distribution of health across the population or if keeping these two things separate is the way to go so separating the fair allocation of health from I guess luck if you don't want to call it unfairness and health distributions across I think I may possibly have lost the, the, the thread there. Uh, at one point, I thought what you were wanted to argue is, well, when we're looking at claims, we should be looking at sort of quantitatively what their claims for. We should be looking at their strength. We should also be looking at the extent to which the individual making this claim has had previous claims satisfied or not. And that's a further dimension. Uh, and I. The way I would think of that is that is I would slot that in in a slightly different place. So we're trying to think about uh, what claims a particular individual has, and then we look at that in terms of need. We may look at that in terms of suppose this individual has been injured by the health system and they may have a stronger claim for that. So we look at the various various kinds of things that could generate a claim, and one of the things that might generate the claim as opposed to being a different dimension of claims. Another thing that might generate claims would be, well, look, you haven't drawn on the system at all, and it's it's your turn, as opposed to, you've been in here every day. Um, but of course, the one who's been in there every day may be really unfortunate. May, that may be the person whose need for the health care is much greater. So I'm, uh, I'm not sure that that's that what you're suggesting is another dimension of claims as rather another factor that we might conceivably take into account when we're trying to uh, uh, figure out what claims to healthcare individuals actually have. Now, there was, I thought there was more in what you were saying that I, I didn't quite get. Was there something else that I didn't respond to there? Well, I think you did initially where. So I, the separate piece of the question was 
um, a question of whether the distribution of health in states yes. of individuals across the population is a factor of the fairness that we want to consider right. when considering the allocation of yeah. Well, in my view, and this is something that people disagree about really, really sharply, uh, I'm not inclined to think to uh, look at the way the world is apart from uh, human action and apart from the action of responsible agents and say, that's fair, that's unfair. Um, states of affairs that human beings haven't been responsible for causing it may be unfair that individuals are not uh, remediating or uh, f fixing those things, but uh, I'm not inclined to say uh, the fact that uh, one individual's, uh, there's been a flood and one individual's uh, topsoil has been uh, you know, eroded and has wound up on my, uh, on my farm and I'm now doing great. I don't see that as unfair uh, I see that as, you know, nature just does, uh, uh, does its thing. Now, that doesn't mean that one can't judge the fairness of the distribution of health in a society, but in doing that, one's going to be judging that on the basis of, first, the counterfactual, wh how else might it be? How else can indivi could individuals uh, organize things? And if it's such that it could have been different and is unfair in other regards, that, then I think we can certainly uh, uh, judge the distribution of health in a society. But exactly what a fair distribution would be is extremely puzzling. Uh, it's not as if we could conceivably uh, imagine a society where everyone was in equal health. When you get to be uh, you know, 70, 80, or 90, we don't expect your health to be the same as it would be in age 20, and we don't think that there's a serious inequality that most 80-year-olds uh, really can't run marathons. Uh, so exactly how we, and of course, uh, is it unfair that some individuals get incurable diseases? I don't think it's unfair. I think it's, it's sad and unfortunate, but I don't think there's anything unfair about it. And I, I and well, I was going to add a slur on those people who think it is fair, but I, I won't. <laughs> it, it seems like another objection to the cost-effectiveness allocation model is that geography is left out of the equation. And oftentimes there's a cost associated with transporting a patient to receive yes. that service. Um, so either that, and pre at present, the way it works most of the time is that the patient then has to bear that cost, and they may or may not have the capacity to do so. Right. Um, or it, it, if you bring it then into the, the equation, that's going to vary geographically. There are going to be uh, certain interventions that have greater cost efficacy depending on, the, on your immediate vicinity right. uh, to a, a tertiary care center. Um, so do you, do you think that other factors beyond the intervention itself, particularly labor transportation that's involved, need to be discussed as part of this fairness model? Uh, yes. Uh, what you're describing is another aspect of what I call the discrimination objection against uh, cost effectiveness. So you can discriminate in the sense that people who have uh, uh, independent pre-existing disabilities, you get less benefit from treating them. But you may also, uh, it may also be the case that people have certain disabilities, well, the result is it's more expensive to treat them. And individuals who live in remote areas, it's much more expensive to treat them. So cost effective, uh, the cost effective thing says, well, you treat individuals who are easy to treat first because those, those are the ones that you get the uh, greatest benefit. And so this is all part and parcel of what I described as the, the discrimination objection. Now, the other aspect in what you mentioned there is that there's lots of things that are relevant to health other than health care. And you know, the existence of roads, for example, that make it easy for individuals in certain areas to reach uh, health care providers, that's not health care, but it's something that's uh, enormously relevant to uh, health outcomes. So, uh, and it wouldn't presumably come out of the health care budget, 
but that's part of the artificiality of supposing that we simply uh, have, we've already uh, assigned funds to different areas of governmental responsibility, and that's fixed and just given, uh, and that the role of transportation is simply to uh, make it the case that people can efficiently move goods, let's say, and then we leave healthcare out of it, which is a mistake. On the other hand, if we didn't divide things into different budgets, we'd have you know a horrible mess. And so we have to say, okay, we're going to look at these different budgets, but we're going to recognize that uh, the may the best way to treat a certain health problem may be in terms of our educational system or in terms of our transportation system, rather than by means of uh, different allocation of health care itself. Yeah. When, on, on the spectrum of remote areas, yes. one of the things that I think is, a, as far as I know about it, a very positive thing that's being done in Canada is uh, when physicians finish, mm -hmm. they there's enormous incentives to have young physicians go to these remote areas. Yes. And I think that's that's a really useful thing to do. Yes. Uh, uh, and I, I don't know the details of what the incentives are and how they do it, but I think it's a, it has, I think, made a, 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 an appreciable difference uh -huh. in, this, in the situation in a lot of small places out there. Right. Uh, and this isn't exactly uh, an issue of distributing care as opposed to distributing the means of providing care. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, certainly, questions of fairness are go going to arise there if you have populations that don't have access to uh, the care at all. To the care at all, obviously, you've got tremendous problems of fa fairness. Yes. Um, I was just wondering whether, when you're trying to decide what claims people have, or at least how yes. strong their claims are, um, whether you think something like responsibility, assuming you can work that out reliably has any bearing on that? Uh, I think in principle, yes, it does. I'm very cautious about, in practice, uh, placing much emphasis on responsibility. Um, I think that there's an enormous tendency that people have to try to hold those who are ill responsible for their illness, because it's a great way of saying it couldn't happen to me. So I remember. Um, uh, a friend of a friend, his uh, mother had, had just, just died of lung cancer. And she was, it's all her fault that she was a smoker. And what she meant was, it can't happen to me. And so I think there's a tremendous psychological factor whereby we tend to blame people, uh, which is not to say that there may not be, that there are cases of people badly abusing themselves in terms of uh, drugs in terms of uh, uh, alcohol and really uh, being at least causally responsible for uh, their illnesses. But I think in practice, we'd be ill-advised to allow that to uh, affect what we're doing. This is just the, the, the neat part. Yes. Uh, uh, on, the, on the lineups in Canada, uh, they, uh, had, uh, somebody I know, I, I went to the hospital with him, and they thought he might be having a heart attack. Well, he went right to the head of the line immediately. I yes. Mean, there's no, and I think that's good. Sure. But that would be the need part. That, right. Yeah, why? And, uh, right, and you know, certain things that we can do are reversible, and certain things we aren't reversible, and that's going to be very important in our prior prioritizing. say that you've raised enormous problems and I think you're, it's really hard to, 
as you pointed out, they're not something we can just solve very easily. Right. But they're important. And uh, trying to make some improvements there is worth it. Yeah. And I think it's been a useful thing that you've done to well, bring this out. Well, this is essentially my research agenda for the next uh, three years of this new position I've, I'm taking. Yeah. Where I'll, I'll have time to drive myself nuts and probably make no progress at all on these issues. <laughs> but. Well, in terms, of, in terms of philosophical labor, do you think it's better to focus on some of the issues to do with cost effectiveness, like the measures, or to work out some role for um, which problems are problems of fairness and then how important they are to the decisions we get made as against the other kind of more utilitarian considerations? I don't know how to prioritize that. Uh, in my book on uh, health measurement, my, the value of health book, I'm very, very critical of where these quality numbers come from. Uh, the, in these surveys, people are asked questions like, well, um, suppose that you had 10 years to live in a circumstance where you had um, chronic heart failure, you couldn't really move around very well, uh, and you were in moderate pain, you have 10 years to live, how many years would you give up to, so uh, suppose instead you had some lesser amount of time in full health, let's say X years in full health or seven years in full health. Would you prefer 10 years in this diminished health state to seven years in full health? So people are asked questions like this. And of course, if you actually faced a question like that in your, in your real life, if it was a real question, that would really be a hard one. You would want to talk about it and think about it. People answer in 15 seconds flat. And on the basis of that, numbers are assigned to uh, different kinds of health states. And uh, I don't think people are ask, answering the questions that are being asked there because the questions are way too difficult. And I don't think one should be placing a lot of confidence in the numbers that come out of this. Uh, I mean, the numbers are calculated to three significant digits, and I think this is uh, uh, bogus. And it's on the basis of those numbers that judgments of cost effectiveness are made. Now. So I think those are those, that's a really yeah, serious a problem. Option. But I also <laughs> think that you know they're actually cost effectiveness actually being used. There are real questions about um, the, the fairness of using it, and there are some people who would make much more serious objections to the fairness of using it than I would, and would want to abandon it altogether. And so those questions are also, I think, really serious and pressing. So I, I think it'd be great if more of you wanted to work on this and so we could have a division of labor and uh, all these problems being pursued. Too many just for me. All right, well, on that invitation. <laughs> well, there actually was one other oh, question. Oh, I was going to ask, it seems like a lot of the objections to the cost effectiveness approach can be handled through the use of weights on different population groups. Like how you come up with those, those weights are obviously very difficult and very complex and controversial, but if you were going to, for example, you're dealing with the the distance from major cities, and we start weighting people in little areas in slightly higher weight, that would answer that objection. Uh, what's actually being done, which is a little bit like what you're proposing, is that uh, cost effect. The, instead of just looking at overall cost effectiveness, one looks at differentially uh, how does it how does it uh, work out with respect to a variety of different populations. And so instead of weighting things, it's a way of looking at, you know, uh, how, to what extent will this advantage or disadvantage one population as opposed to another? Um, the weights would be difficult because uh, depending on what kinds of treatments we have and the difficulties, uh, you know, if we're talking about uh, different kinds of uh, health interventions, I think that we might want to have different weights for different kinds of health interventions. I think we'd never actually be able to come up with those weights and it would just be way too complicated. Um, but looking at how this affects specific populations is something that's already being done and is one of the ways that the disastrous ethical implications that I described are avoided. Uh, 
it's not the view that cost effectiveness analysis is actually being used to euthanize certain certain people so we get a healthier population or anything like that. Okay, great. Let's, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you.